Michael Kramer says he works here for the money. And the <laughs> <laughs> he's also one of the program's founding members, and he's designed the William Sullivan uh, Jewish Arts Seminar in, it pre in its present incarnation. He's the only one of us in the creative writing program who teaches every single creative writing program, uh, teach students in our program, and a scholar and editor of Jewish American literature and a recent translator of the work of S.Y. Agnon. Michael will now introduce Alan Hoffman and Joseph Sandash. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> below me in this entertainment scale. <laughs> the director of the creative writing program and the dean. <laughs> okay. An old man lived alone in the forest. He was the last of his family, and he was so sick and feeble that he could hardly cook his gruel. Well, one cold day he had no more firewood, and he went out to gather some. He was stooped and old, and he carried a rope. In the woods, he spread the rope on the snow, and he laid his fuel on it and tied a knot, but he was too weak to lift the bundle. This was too much for him. He lifted his eyes and called to heaven, Gott Miner, send me death. All at once, he saw the angel of death coming toward him. Everybody's waiting for the punchline. <laughs> Uh, and the angel of death said to him, You sent for me? What do you want? And the old man thought quickly and said, Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I can't get these sticks up on my back and wonder if you'd mind giving me a hand. <laughs> now, when I was asked to participate in this opening event of Tsuris and Other Literary Delights, uh, particularly to moderate this evening on Tsuris and Humor, I thought of this story. Um, it was recorded a half century ago by none other than Saul Bellow in his introduction to his paperback collection, Great Jewish Short Stories. Bellow tells us there that he had heard the story from his East European immigrant father, and he identifies it as one of the many stories without which daily life would have been inconceivable for his father's generation of Jews. Inconceivable, and if I may add, if, my, if I may add a gloss to Bellow's commentary on the story that his father may very well have heard from his father, and, and so on, inconceivable and unbearable. For the Jews, for the life of the Jews is hard, unbearably hard, and these stories, these characteristically Jewish stories, according to Bellow, helped lighten the burden and restore the equilibrium of sanity. In Jewish stories, he writes, Laughter and trembling both play a role. Each is crucial. And in Jewish stories, the two are so curiously mingled, this is Bellow's language, that it is not easy to determine the precise relations of the two. Equilibrium demands that laughter and trembling remain in creative tension. Laughter without trembling is just frivolity. Trembling without laughter, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> it's not that Jews have cornered the market on laughter. There is no protocols of the elders of the Borscht Belt. <laughs> Bello off thank you for laughing. <laughs> Bello offers the examples of Aristophanes and Lucian and Rabelais. But the comic genius of the Jews, he writes, is different, mysterious, and will always elude our best efforts to explain it including the efforts of Jews, he suggests, Jews like Sigmund Freud. Still, he offers one such effort in his little essay, attributed to a Jewish writer called Hyman Slate, to close this section of his introduction. Laughter, Hyman Slate writes, may be offered as proof of the existence of God. Why? Because existence is simply too funny to be uncaused. The real secret, 
The real secret, the ultimate mystery, may never reveal itself to a Spinoza, but when we laugh, the idea, he says, is remotely Hasidic, when we laugh, our minds refer us to God's existence. Chaos is exposed. That's soul bell. From laughter and trembling tonight, service and humor. From Spinoza and Freud and Soul Bellow to Alan Hoffman and Joseph Skybell. Whatever we may think of Bellow's remarks as a theory of Jewish literature, I think it serves well to set the proper tone for this very somber evening. Not only does it put into relief the underlying theme of the conference, the profundity of the funny, the seriousness of the silly, but it also provides us with a more than rudimentary sense of Jewish literary tradition, a self-conscious and self-generated history of texts, commenting on other texts, commenting on yet other texts, going all the way back to the Bible, a tradition that persists despite the enormousness and enormity of the changes that have characterized the history of the Jews in modern times, a tradition to which Bello insists that he belongs despite his well-known renunciation of the title Jewish writer. The two estimable writers we're going to spend the evening with are not only masters of laughter and trembling, of tzuras and humor, but of the Jewish literary tradition in all its thickness and complexity. I'm going to introduce each of them to you separately and ask each to read a selection of his work, and then we'll sit and then schmooze a bit. Okay. When Alan Hoffman, Linda Ziskud, and I helped Shandy put uh, the creative writing program together in those early years, we had to rely heavily on certain intangibles. Intangibles by which I mean that we had no significant institutional, institutional support, by which I mean that we had very little money. <laughs> the intangibles we relied upon were Shandy's fire, her vision, her refusal to let the impossible stand in her way, and her ability to inspire the enthusiasm of others. One other intangible we relied upon was the kindness of strangers, or what we might call in this country, the friar factor. <laughs> the willingness of very fine writers to teach for us for next to nothing. On top of that list of literary friaring is our special guest tonight, Joseph Sato. <laughs> in the winter of 2003, when we were surviving by the skin of our teeth and flying by the seat of our pants, talk about cliches, right? <laughs> um, Shane D. called me up and asked me if I knew a writer by the name of Joseph Skybell. And I responded, who? <laughs> she told me that Melvin Bouquet had recommended him to teach our summer seminar and that I just had to read his novel, Blessing on the Moon. So I picked up the book, saw that it begins with epigraphs from the book of Job and from Maimonides, and it did not take, long, take me long to realize that I was reading a writer of real talent, that the epigraphs were not just epigraphs, but spoke to a dense Jewish quality of mind, to a contemporary literary voice that spoke with a deep respect for Jewish literary tradition. I read, and I laughed, and I trembled. So I called him up, and his wife Barbara answered and told me that I couldn't speak to him because he was at a Talmud class. I took this as a sign. <laughs> when I finally got hold of him, I told him that we had no money <laughs> and couldn't really pay him, and that yes, indeed, bombs were going off in the streets of our cities, <laughs> but that we'd really, really like to have him come into the <laughs> And Joseph said, you really can't pay me? <laughs> and I said, no but I'd be happy to host him sometime for Shabbos. <laughs> well, he said, in that case, sure, I'd love to come. <coughs> history. Joseph Skybell was born in Lubbock, Texas, birthplace of rock and roll legend Buddy Holly. <laughs> Are you applauding Buddy Holly or me? <laughs> Some claim uh, that Joseph is actually the Gilgul of Buddy Holly. <laughs> but I've heard him sing and play guitar, so I know it's not true. <laughs> he is, however, the fine author of three very, very fine novels. His first, The Blessing on the Moon, which I've talked about, has already been the subject of a number of scholarly works, including a master's thesis by one of our own, 
graduate students. It has also been turned into an opera by composer Andy Kirstein with a libretto by Joseph, which had its premiere in Vancouver in February with a concert version staged in New York City. And now there's talk about producing the opera in Bialystok this summer. This novel has been translated into Mandarin. <laughs> it's going to last. <laughs> His second novel, The English Disease, is a fascinating, fascinating meditation on Jewish assimilation and the Marx Brothers. Really. And his third novel, it's my favorite part anyway, and his third novel, except for the closing line, and his third novel, A Curable Romantic, is an, extraordinarily, is an extraordinary historical novel that captures the secularization of Jewish culture in the first half of the 20th century, weaving together Freud's theories, Zamenhof's Esperanto movement, Herzl's Zionism, with Hasidic mysticism, and tales of angels and divics. It's a novel that Nobel laureate J.M. Kotzea calls intellectual comedy of the highest order. Joseph Skybell has won numerous awards, including the Richard and Hinda Rosenthal Foundation Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Fiction, and, and the Samuel R. Choice Award in Jewish Fiction. He's Professor of English and Creative Writing at Emory University, where he directs the Richard Elman Lectures in Modern Literature. Joseph Skanko. Thank you, Michael. Um, I thought I was coming back to get the checks, but that's, that's not the case. Then you're really fired. <laughs> Um, no, really, um, the real pain that all these years have been the friendship of Michael and Alan and all the people associated with the program. And, uh, you know, I feel very rewarded and uh, enriched by that. However, I want to say, I never found Alan very funny. <laughs> so I don't understand this order thing. <laughs> but I'd also like... First, I'd like to say, uh, 10 years ago or so, when uh, I did somehow get these three semesters off, and I thought, I'd really like to go teach at, in Israel. Or I'd like to go to Israel, and I wonder how I could do it. And everybody I asked said to me, call Shandy Rudolph. And I heard it about three times in two days. So I thought, okay, I'll call this woman. I don't know who she is. And I called her, and I think one call later, I was you know, almost ready to come. She arranged everything. And uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, honoring her memory. And I hope her memory will always continue to be a blessing. Uh, and I want to say it's just an honor to be here um, celebrating the work and the accomplishments and the academic life of Alan Hoffman. Often, you know, it seems to me like sometimes you, you read a writer and then you meet them and you can never kind of become friends with writers who you admire beforehand. Um, but it's always a special thing to sort of meet somebody, like them, become their friend, and then read their work and find out, oh, you, that your, their work is really admirable. Uh, and then you can admire it and love it. And that was the case with Alan. I mean, uh, his, sometimes I think his, Large personality obscures absolute, you know, the fineness of his work. His, uh, those novels are just really incredible. And I feel it's a real honor to be here in celebration of Alan and his work. So uh, I always, whenever I come to Israel, I seem to read the wrong thing. <laughs> oh, God. So, <laughs> Michael asked me the other day, he said, what do you read? And I you know, cap right into that. But oh, I now I think I know why. He, he me that. Um, so this is something I'm working on now. It's it's sort of a nonfiction memoir. It's the prologue to it. It has almost nothing Jewish about it. So sorry. Okay. Let's see. What is that source? There's source and there's obsession in it. I don't know if there's any entertainment. Um, it's called. It's from a book. Uh, called My Father's Guitar and Other Imaginary Things. So this is the prologue. 
It all started about five years ago when I received a call from a colleague of mine. We'd done a bit of work together planning a new major for the college where we teach, and we'd been compensated for this work with a small bonus to our travel and research funds. My colleague was calling to let me know, to, to alert me to the fact, something he'd only then discovered, that if these funds were spent by the end of that very day, they'd be forfeited and returned to the college. I gathered up all the work-related receipts I could find, but when I totaled them up, I still had $177 left. And so I did the only thing I could think to do, the only reasonable thing a person in my situation could do. I went down to my local guitar center, and I flagged down the salesman. I told him I had $177 to spend before midnight that night. And I asked him if he'd be willing to part with a Martin backpacker for precisely that amount, tax and case included. The Martin backpacker, if you've never seen one, is a small broom-shaped guitar that's light enough to be carried out into the woods on a backpacking trip if you were so inclined. It's also, according to the Martin catalog, the first guitar ever sent into outer space. <laughs> the sales guy told me he'd be delighted to sell me the guitar for that price, and he went into the back to get one. Now, this made me extraordinarily happy for two reasons. First, though I'd been playing music since I was nine, I hadn't gotten a new guitar since I was 14. I'd been playing less and less over the years, and I was unprepared for the sense of a renewed love affair that a new instrument brings with it. Secondly, I retained in my memory a sharply etched image of my father, leaning the great bulk of his body against the counter of Herod's music shop in Lubbock, Texas, bargaining with Clyde, the manager there, over the blue electric Fender Mustang he was buying to replace the clunky Fender acoustic he'd originally brought home for me when I'd mentioned to him that I thought I might like to learn to play the guitar. Big and cumbersome, this acoustic guitar was too difficult for me to play. The neck was thick and beefy, and the strings were so high you could have hung laundry from them. As a kid, I was mortified by my father's bargaining. Everywhere else when you bought something, you paid what they asked for it. But dad was a businessman, he was a merchant, and he understood about markup. There's the Jewish element. <laughs> Still, I was afraid he might offend Clyde, that this back and forthing of theirs might end in a stalemate, or worse, an argument. Dad had an eruptive, unpredictable temper. And I'd lose not only the guitar, but Clyde's affection, which would mean having to go elsewhere for my lessons. My teacher at Harrods was a lanky, hippie iconoclast named Spider Johnson. This is all true, by the way. He was an important, liberating presence in my young life, and I didn't want to lose contact with him. I worried as well that all this handling might seem too Jewish for Clyde, or for Mr. Harrod, the patrician owner of the shop. The founding conductor of the Lovell Symphony Orchestra, Mr. Harrod saw to the violins, by Clyde handled the guitars. But Clyde, it turned out, was happy for the sale, as was the guy at the guitar center, as was I. I'm sure it had more to do with my father than with the money, but the 40 or so bucks the guitar center guy, but the 40 or so bucks the guitar center guy was willing to knock off the backpacker left me feeling inordinately potent as a man. <laughs> I brought the little Martin home, and for my birthday, Barbara, and my wife, bought me a couple of song books containing hits from the 1920s and 30s. And I loved nothing better than to sit at our kitchen table late into the night, playing my little broom-shaped guitar and singing songs like Button Up Your Overcoat, Bye Bye Blackbird, and California Here I Come. My father was hospitalized a year or so after I bought the little backpacker. He was living in Oklahoma City at the time with his second wife. My mother had died years before. And my brothers and sisters and I each received a call telling us that we'd better get up there to see him. No one expected him to leave the hospital. His kidneys were shot, and he had a cascading host of other medical issues. His organs are just plumb wore out, 
his nephrologist told me in her Oklahoma accent. As soon as we all arrived, in fact, Dad went into a coma. At one point, there was even a code blue. The machines in his ICU room started whirring. The staff rushed in and pulled the curtains. The hospital chaplain even showed up, a fretful-looking woman in a boxy skirt set. May I sit with you? She asked each of us in turn, inflecting the verb somehow with overtones of Christian sodality. <laughs> no thanks, we each said. <coughs> she seemed relieved. Clutching her files to her chest, she sat down and disappeared when no one was looking. As for the rest of us, we braced ourselves and waited for our father to die. But our father didn't die. Contrary to all expect expectations, he came out of the coma. Well enough to leave the ICU, eventually he was furloughed to an ordinary hospital room, and though he'd spend nearly 60 days as an inpatient, he was ultimately released. During those 60 days, whenever I came to visit him, those 60 days, by the way, were he went into the hospital on Tishabov and he came out the day after Yom Kippur, <laughs> which figures in later, but this, we all know what those days are about. During those 60 days, whenever I came to visit him, I brought the little backpacker along. We didn't have a lot of common interests, my father and I. Our conversations were often difficult and halting, but music was something we both loved, and I'd sit by his bed and play for him. It helped to pass the hours for both of us, and the odd-shaped guitar proved a useful conversation piece with the nurses. I didn't know what was going on in my father's marriage, but when he left the hospital, he was no longer welcome at home. He ended up in Dallas, living in Mrs. Rudd's condominium. Mrs. Rudd <coughs> was my Uncle Richard's mother-in-law. Too frail at 90-something to travel from her home in Wichita, she no longer used the place, and my father moved in in a quiet, if no less flagrant, violation of the condo's board rules, which forbade any and all forms of subletting. I continued bringing the little Martin along whenever I visited. It was so light and easy to pack, and on one occasion, we all sat together as a family in Mrs. Rudd's living room, while my brother-in-law, Alan, and I took turns on the guitar. Dad joined in singing old cowboy and Sammy fraternity songs. He seemed to enjoy himself, and one day he told me he thought maybe he'd buy himself a guitar, take a few lessons. Why not? He was retired and living alone with a pair of alternating caregivers. He had the time, and he asked me for the advice, and he asked me for advice on what to buy. I was quite proud of him. Proud at the age of 76, he was up for something new. And if for some reason I can't learn it, he said, I'll give it to you, and you'll keep it. The next time I went to Dallas, we all sat around again in Mrs. Rudd's living room, singing and playing, and when I took the turn on my father's new guitar, I remember thinking, whoa, this is a beautiful instrument. Curvier than most guitars, it was shaped like a figure eight, with the upper bouts, the shoulders, as wide and round as the lower bouts, the hips. And the top, side, and back were all a matching, handsome, dark, nutty brown. That's a dreadnought guitar, my friend Elbine told me when I described it to him later. Big and round, he said. I nodded. He seemed to know what he was talking about. They're called dreadnoughts, yeah, he said. After the battleships, because they're so big and round, you have to play them standing up. Yeah, well, whatever, I said. It's just a beautiful instrument, and whether my father gives it to me now or whether it comes down to me years later, I might just hang it on a wall as a symbol of my father's will, you know, to keep learning and moving forward. And, also, because it's just so damned beautiful. I've, I've never, I think, don't think I've ever seen a guitar quite as beautiful as that. As it turned out, Dad's arthritis was too bad for him to pursue the guitar in earnest. And one day, when my daughter Ariana and I were in Dallas, he said to me, Joseph, take that guitar. I'm never going to learn it. Really, Dad, I said, take it, take it, he said. Because it's just so beautiful, Dad. It's really such a beautiful guitar. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure, he said. Still, I was torn. On the one hand, I hated to see him giving up on it. But on the other, I was thrilled to have the guitar. Either way, he was adamant. And when we said our goodbyes, Ariana carried the guitar out of Mrs. Rudd's condo while I went to get the car. By the time I'd driven back to the Port Crochet, she had taken it out of its case and was standing on one foot, balancing it on a raised leg, strumming a few chords. 
I pulled up and looked at the guitar and I thought, hey, that's not my father's guitar. It wasn't the guitar I remembered, the one shaped like an infinity sign with a nutty brown color. In fact, there was nothing special about this guitar at all. It was nothing but a cheap, blonde Alvarez. Hey, Dan, I said that night at dinner, that's not the original guitar you bought, is it? I was sitting next to him, and I couldn't help asking him the question. He didn't quite seem to understand, though, which wasn't surprising. The room was noisy. I was sitting on his bad side, and what I was asking him was utterly nonsensical. I mean, you didn't buy two guitars, did you? No, no. But, well, but then, I mean, what happened to the first guitar? No, that is the first guitar, he said. Maybe my brother-in-law stole it. This was my next thought. Maybe he swapped it out for the Alvarez when he thought no one was looking. There were only two problems with this. First, Alan would never have done such a thing. He was too honest. And second, if he had, he'd never have gotten away with it. Eventually, I'd see the guitar at his house. Now, all this was very problematical for me, mostly because my sisters have always insisted especially when it comes to family history, that my grasp upon reality, how to put this kindly, is less than firm. That for me, memory and imagination are like two rivers that converge. That I tend to misremember things, or God help us more probably make them up. Now even I will admit that the two of them seem to have grown up in an entirely different household from mine. They were born 18 months apart, and because they're close not only in age, but in temperament, their versions of our family history are apt to match up. A fact I always attributed to a good dose of denial on their parts. But for the first time, I began to wonder if my sisters hadn't been right all along. I mean, if I could dream a guitar up out of thin air, what else over the years had I imagined? Well, the mystery of where this imaginary guitar came from persisted literally for years until sometimes, sometime after my father's death when the realization struck me with absolute clarity that the first guitar my father had bought me, that clunky, nearly unplayable Fender acoustic, the one with strings so high you could have hung laundry from them, had been figure eight in shape with a handsome nutty brown color. I'd forgotten all about that guitar, and now I realized, in a mental move that was laughably Freudian, filled with wish fulfillment and dreamlike distortions, that I'd substituted the first guitar my father had given me with the last guitar he'd ever give me, hoping in this way, I suppose, to reverse time and keep him alive. It didn't work, of course. But with a part of my inheritance, I bought a beautiful, handsome acoustic archtop guitar, which I named Fig partly because the figures in the, maple, in the maple back look like the insides of fig, and also because fig stands for father's imaginary guitar. <laughs> and these days, it's with fig that I sit up late into the night at my kitchen table, singing these great old songs from the 20s and the 30s, songs like, I can't give you anything but love, and button up your overcoat, you belong to me. Thank you.